net metering. So net metering is, on a day like today, it's a beautiful day, I'm creating about twice as much electricity as I'm using. Really? And what it's doing is, you know what an electric meter looks like. You go in the basement, the meter is going around and around and yes. it tells you how much you're being, you're charging. They're charging. Well, if you go into my electrical room today, my meter is running backwards. So I'm building up credit. And then tonight, when the sun goes down and I need electricity again, it reverses direction and I start taking it back from the, uh, uh, from the electrical grid. That's amazing. It's aimed to replace about 80% of, of the total electrical use we have here. You never want to go to 100% because you want to keep the, uh, the grid wanting to stay connected to you. That way I don't have to buy batteries. I can, oh. use, the, I can use the grid as a battery effectively. People ask, it's a slightly odd system. You see, instead of normally you, you bury the posts into the ground to hold it up. And you see here, it's it's on recycled concrete caseholes. I did notice that. So the reason for that is that if I make a mess, it's up to me to clean it up. So we treat all of our water, all of our septic water, our waste water, everything else on site. So these here, these four beds, are about 10 feet deep and about 12 or 14 feet square. And what happens is the septic water which is stored in big tanks here so somebody flushing toilets or cleaning tanks or whatever is brought in and it's metered just under the surface about a foot down out into the, these beds it works its way through about 10 feet of, of filtration so sand and clay and gravel and wood chips and everything else it gets to the bottom and it's pumped up to the next bed where it again percolates its way down. So after it goes through four beds, it's drinkable. Instead of using it for irrigation, because we don't do enough irrigation to make it worthwhile, it then gets spread out underneath the surface of this whole meadow here. It's like a septic tank, a septic bed, except it's much smaller because the water is clean. It's not, not uh, contaminated. If I wanted to put the solar field standard drilling holes down into the bed, I would have had to talk to the Ministry of Environment. But because they're on the surface, I haven't touched the surface. So that's where we get, use all of our water that uh, uh, we've treated, that we've used on site and then, and then treated. And underneath that, or around it, there is uh, drainage tiles, which then takes the water to the creek and it goes back to Lake Ontario. So you in Montana, you're really dry. You're yes. worried about water. Here, we're not short of water. Um, you know, we've got Lake Erie over there, we've got Lake Ontario behind us. What we're short of is clean water. So we have to make sure that anything we return to the water courses is clean. And so everything is filtered through uh, uh, soil. It comes, you know, from five, six, seven feet down, which is where the drainage tiles are. And then it's taken off to, there's a, a canal it's, a, it's called Six Mile Creek, but it's actually a canal just where those trees are. That's just a phenomenal idea. Yeah. Well, it, you know, some people, you can, if you're hooked up to town sewers, then somebody else treats it. Or you can just have holding tanks and then it gets hauled away and somebody else has to treat it. But we've, for way too long, we've been letting somebody else clean up our mess and, and it just doesn't work. So, as far as I think you, you, you were looking at the, at the green map yes. at the beginning. So the reason for that is that, especially before COVID, the idea is we want to see as many people here. They all come in and, and, and they're all going to stand shoulder to shoulder in the, in, in the tasting bar and it's going to be loud and, and busy and stuff like that. But we wanted people to know some of the ideas that we stand for. And, you know, if you read half of that, you go, Ooh, maybe they're interested in sustainability. What's happened since COVID is that we're very limited on the number of people we can see, but almost everybody who comes is coming because they've done a bit of research. We're not the first bathroom off the QEW, which is what the real reason that people used to come 
now people do a little bit of research and they go, organic sustainability, we're really interested. So the people we do see are far more engaged in, in what we're doing. And that's what you want because what Absolutely. you're doing here is truly remarkable. Absolutely. We think so. We think so. And, and what it's done, and especially with what we call purple glove delivery, which is either me or Andrew hand delivering all of the parcels, it allows us to create that relationship. And, and we're depending much less on the LCBO or restaurants um, dealing with us. It's much more direct to consumer, or it's dealing with people that are interested in what we're doing. So it's, it's really positive as far as I'm concerned. And people who resonate with your story and your mission. Yeah, and if they, if they just want to go and drink crap, they can, there's lots of other places they can do that. Very true. <laughs> Because one thing, you know, we it comes back to, we, we don't make cheap wine. We can't. If you want to do it properly, wine will always be more expensive. And so 50% of the people out there don't care. Okay, go don't care at someone else. They can sell cheap wine. Don't give me a hassle because... Yeah. And yeah. you make a quality product that Absolutely. is great for the environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. So to us, it's really important and we're always looking for new ways to improve it. That's fantastic how you look at the advancements in technology and what you can do for the earth and your winemaking process to become more efficient as well as becoming more sustainable while doing that. Well, and the latest thing that you're gonna be hearing more in addition to sustainable and organics is regenerative agriculture. Yes. So everything we do is regenerative. Like that, that wow. is the whole idea. And that's a fascinating subject as well. Absolutely. So the, the yellow boxes, this big stacks of them in there, those are the grape boxes. Oh, okay. Um, we'll often pick into, to once they're in the boxes, they'll go into totes. Uh, I'll show you the, the, the sorting systems in a minute. They're over there. These are the presses. We've got two, just because it's nice to have a spare. Grapes are put in, there's a bladder inside that expands and, and uh, presses up against the, the juice to, or the fruit to squeeze it. Uh, takes a, depends on what you're doing, but anywhere between an hour and eight hours to, to press grapes. But before we, before we use it, this is the sorting table. So everything gets hand sorted to make sure that what we're using is, is high quality. Again, if it's, uh, if it's not high enough quality, then it's, it's removed. So for red wines, where we're leaving the skins on, uh, you break enough of the structure that you're getting um, juice to start the fermentation. And reds are mostly made in what are called open top fermenters because the, the skins and the seeds that you're putting in, they pick up carbon dioxide, they rise to the surface. So you've got to figure out a way to get those back down into, it's like making tea. So the best of the reds get fermented in oak fermenters. Um, so again, they would be filled up maybe twice a year, maybe once a year, depending on if there's a big enough spread between the early grapes and, and the late grapes. They're pushed in, they're, they're dumped in out of those green totes out there. Fermentation starts, it runs for two weeks or so, and then uh, we drain the, the wine off and then we have to dig the, uh, uh, the grape skins and everything else off and, and run that through the press. If you're doing white wines, you don't need, there's no, um, there's no skins and seeds. So what you do is you either ferment it in barrels, so pump the, the fresh juice into barrel and allow the fermentation to happen there, or in closed top containers like that one there. Okay. Would, uh, uh, would be a white wine fermenter or just used for storage. So oak gives the, you know, the finest wines are, are aged in oak. They're about a thousand to fourteen hundred dollars US each, and they last four or five years. Okay. Wow. This is just really, really neat. <laughs> so what we, what we do, rather than buying and, and owning a, a bottling line, which is expensive, we're only used for 10 days a year, um, there's now a mobile bottling system, so we're set up for it. So they would come in 10 times a year and, and they do the bottling for us and stuff like that. It, it saves us having to invest in it, but also, you know, it takes a long time to really get used to running a bottling line. Let them do it. It's way easier. So that makes life a lot easier. And how long would you say the process is for the grape to um, go from having being grown to the bottle of wine on your table? So that, again, that depends on the wine. Yes. So for instance, uh, 
some of these reds that are in barrel now would be not only 2021 reds, there would probably still be some 2020 reds. So two years before it's in bottle. And yet other things, uh, the orange wines, the rosés tend to be eight weeks from, from picking the grapes and, and, and being ready to bottle. Wow. So it, it really depends on what you're aiming at. Yeah, and everyone is different. You know, there's, there's some people that might even leave three or four years in barrel. So it, it depends on what you're, what you're heading for. A lot of these things, it's like asking when is a bottle of wine ready to drink? Well, those are decisions that we're making. Um, and a lot of it depends on what we think people are going to use it for. So if, are people looking to, to have it young and, and refreshing, or are they looking to have something deep and dark and, and, you know, 25 years old? What is one of your favorite wines that you produce? So I get that, asked that all the time. And my straight answer, my facetious answer is, it's like asking which, which is my favorite child. The real answer is that wines are always situational. So do I want to sit on a patio with my friends and have a nice chat and have social lubricant? Maybe that's a rosé. Do I want something big and dark to invite to a dinner party and pay no attention to the food or my friends but to concentrate on the wine? That's a, you know, a $200 bottle of California Cabernet. And you know, anybody who opens a $200 bottle of California Cabernet and sits on a patio with their friends and doesn't pay attention to it is crazy. Um, you know, you're wasting the value of the wine. So it all depends on the situation. And so there is no one answer. Uh, you know, we do two orange wines. One is, is more intense than the other. Which is better? Well, it depends. If I'm sitting in, in the wintertime and I'm eating stew and I want to pay attention to the wine, then it's the estate. And if I want to sit and, and have a glass of wine with my friends and, and not necessarily pay as much attention to it, then it's the, uh, uh, the triumph. It's all the situation. It's all the situation. It's, it's like, what is your favorite piece of clothes? Well, am I going out to the prom or am I going out to drive the combine? Yes. <laughs> Very different situations. Absolutely. So it's the same thing with wine. It's exactly the same thing with wine. It's like saying, what's the best food in the world? What do you want it for? That's a very great point. Yeah. So what we try and do is, is we try and make a, a, a wide enough range in, in the wine that we do something for everybody. Could you give me a background about yourself and how you got involved in the winemaking? I've been a farmer all my life. And I, if I get bored, you know, with a little ADD, I get bored with things. So about every seven years, I reinvent what I am as far as farming is concerned. So whether it was dairy farming and then cash crop farming and roadside marketing and then starting the winery uh, and then moving to specifically the, the wine business. And when you first start out, you're trying to be all things to all people. And now we've realized we don't want to be all things to all people. We need to focus on our customers that like us and, and, and care about us. There's a big wine show in, in France every second year called Vin Expo. It used to be the biggest wine show in the world. And when you walk in there, there's probably 60,000 different wines on show. And when you go back two years later, maybe one in a hundred is the same. Wow. It's almost everything is different. Because even if you're buying the same wine, Gallo or Southbrook or whatever. There's so many variables that change it. Next year is going to be a different vintage. And each different vintage will taste differently. Two reasons I love wine. And more than straight agricultural products. When we were growing strawberries, we'd pick a whole crap load of strawberries. And if they didn't sell today, they weren't as good tomorrow. In the wine business, if it doesn't sell today, it could be better tomorrow. But the other, the other critical thing, different from almost everything else, Starbucks trying to figure out the same thing. You go to the grocery store, you buy a loaf of bread, it may be wheat from Montana, it may be wheat from uh, Min uh, Minnesota, it may be meat, uh, wheat from Saskatchewan or, or uh, Manitoba. When you buy wine, it's always by country, at least. I buy Canadian, I buy American, I buy French. It probably is by state. I buy Ontario, I buy BC, I buy California, I buy Washington, I buy Oregon. Could well be by county. 
I buy Napa, I buy Sonoma, I buy San Luis Obispo. It could be by town. I buy Rutherford, I buy uh, uh, Yountville, I buy, you know, it's all on the label and it's legally defined. Nobody can cheat. If it says Yountville, it is produced from Yountville grapes. Even cooler, if you buy our estate Cabernet Sauvignon, we have two of them. One is the witness block, which is the field we just walked through, and the other is from one of the back blocks. And the only place in the world that can have produced Southbrook, witness block, Cabernet Sauvignon, is that field. No That's amazing. Can. Starbucks is trying to do it with, you know, country of origin and, and farm of origin coffees because they realize that the more precise you can be, the more you can charge. If you're not, to go right back to the beginning, if you're producing commodity as your father is doing, he can't dictate his own price. Exactly. Whereas with witness block and estate wine, I can produce, I can set my own price. And people might not think it's worth it, and they have the choice not to buy it. But if they think it's worth it, they can only get it from me. I can add value is the old line for agriculture. And the person that adds the value is the person that makes the money. I couldn't agree more. So. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed and learned a little bit more about how your grape eventually goes from the vine to your wine bottle. And thank you so much for the tour. It was just incredible. Thank you so much. Anything we can do to promote local agriculture is exactly what I want. Well, it was wonderful touring and you have the most spectacular operation and vineyard. Thank you very much. We try to think of everything. Yes, and you really do. Where can people go to learn more about your vineyard and winery? Come to our website, just southbrook.com. Uh, we ship all across Canada. Sadly, we can't ship anything into the United States. Come um, and see us. Yes, you definitely should. This is a wonderful experience. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kate. Make sure to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye.